be chatting. It's a pleasure to meet you. Hey, great to meet you both. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. So this month, we are partnered with Newsweek to focus on issues related to Generation Z. Uh, today, we are going to focus on education, which is extraordinarily relevant, being that Gen Z is primarily of college age or younger, and you are the Secretary of Education. So could you start by telling us a little bit about the Department of Education and what you're responsible for, and a little bit about your job on a day-to-day -day basis? Definitely, definitely. Listen, I'm honored to serve as the 12th Secretary of Education for the United States. And, you know, at this critical point in, in our country's history, uh, where we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, we have to really heal and, and, and grow together. And uh, so I'm humbled to be serving as Secretary of Education at this point. Uh, you know, we serve uh, pre-K through 12 and then higher education. There's so much that goes along with it. Not only the reading, writing, and arithmetic, but I like to add that fourth R of relationships, making sure students have meals, making sure college is affordable and accessible to all students. There's a lot of big work there, and it, it's, a, it's an important time in our country's history to make sure we get it right as we reopen our schools and make sure that our colleges are embracing all learners who want to have that opportunity. Sure. Uh, during your recent school visit in Philadelphia, you said we need to offer students in-person learning options as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. What does a safe return to in-person learning look like for the Biden administration? Specifically, what safety measures are you implementing to prevent the spread of COVID? Thanks, Chris, for that question. You know, it's critically important to answer that first by saying we know there is no substitute for in-person learning. The biggest equity lever we have is providing safe uh, in-person learning options for students. We know as much as we work really hard to try to get the laptops to connect and make sure that there's internet access, that relationship that students have with their peers and with their teachers, there's no substitute for that. But to do it, you have to do it safely. And you know, my experience in Connecticut when, when we were doing this, we knew that strict adherence to mitigation strategies matters. Uh, we knew that making sure your buildings are clean, making sure there's good ventilation, making sure there's distance, um, and that we're monitoring the data to make those decisions. Those were all critical components. Now, the, the president made it very clear he supports uh, a, a quick and safe reopening by adding the prioritization to vaccinations, by making sure that there are funds available for surveillance testing, which educators have been asking for since last March. It's really about making sure it's safe for students, for staff, and also building that confidence that we need so that those families do return. Between March and October, there was a reported 31% increase in emergency room visits related to mental health for young people between 12 and 17. What safety precautions and resources is the department taking to ease the transition for students who are struggling with mental health issues? I was just on a phone call with a bunch of high school and middle school students a little while ago. It really was a great way to spend part of the day listening to what our students are saying. At the end of the day, we serve them, right? So what they said loud and clear is, that relationships and making sure that they're okay. They, they said brain breaks. They really need to make sure that they're going into school environments that are prepared to meet what their social emotional needs are and also their mental health needs. We are in the middle of a pandemic and our school systems have to be prepared to welcome our students back, not only with the academic learning needs that they might have missed, but really to receive them and, and our staff after having experienced uh, traumatic experience like COVID-19. So the American Rescue Plan provides funds and really prioritizes redesigning our schools. We shouldn't go back to the schools of March, 2020. It, it, that's a low bar. We have to make sure that our schools have stronger mental health supports, have uh, better uh, training for all educators, including bus drivers, cafeteria staff, everyone that engages with students to understand the social emotional needs of students. That has to be a prerequisite to getting our schools open quickly and safely. The pandemic really exposed our nation's shortcomings around reliable broadband in rural communities. And some students struggle to keep up with their peers due to a lack of resources like access to the internet or electronic devices. Uh, well, what can be done to improve both the, infra the infrastructure and access to internet services across the country? Thanks, Chris. You know, one of the things we prioritize when we were reopening in Connecticut is closing the digital divide. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, I, I remember mid-March last year, 2020, I spoke to a superintendent of schools of a very well-resourced district, uh, you know, more affluent district. And um, he said, you know what, Miguel, we just turned on the switch, man. We had all our kids had one-to-one -one devices, internet was strong, and we have quality curriculum on the other side of the screen. So teachers had great tools in their toolbox. Then I talked to a superintendent of a district 
uh, where they're uh, less resourced and most of the students fell below, below the poverty threshold, it took four weeks, four weeks before they even connected with the kids. And not to mention, they didn't have laptops, they didn't have a strong internet connection. And even if they did, they didn't have good quality content on the other side of the screen. So it really is about building up that infrastructure, not only to provide the access, uh, broadband access and, and good devices, but quality content so that all students get challenged and, and reach those high levels. And, you know, I, I say the laptop is like the new pencil. It's no longer a privilege. It's no longer something that's cool. It's, it's a necessity to be functional in, in today's society and in today's schools. So we need to close that digital divide across the country once and for all. It's a finite problem to have. And that's something that we need to make sure we're focusing on as we reopen, yeah. That's great. I like that. The laptop's the new pencil. Isn't that the truth? You're just so right. So along those lines, what can we do right now to help students who've fallen behind both due to COVID and other socioeconomic factors? You know, first we have to be open and honest and transparent. There are some students that were impacted by this pandemic more than others. There were some families, some communities that were impacted more than others. You know, I think of students with disabilities, children with autism, who have relied so so much on that one-to-one -one or uh, the hand-over-hand -hand, um, support in their schools who had a laptop. And we know that didn't work for them. So we have to be very open and honest about which students were affected the most and make sure that our resources, our policies, and our decisions as educators uh, are focusing on closing those gaps. The gaps were there before the pandemic. They were made worse during the pandemic. So to close the learning loss or to, to really make sure that we're, uh, we're giving all students an opportunity to recover, we have to make sure that we have after school programs, good summer learning opportunities, great uh, opportunities next year. And it could be smaller class sizes for those kids who experienced the pandemic in worse ways than others. Um, but these are conversations that we need to have now so that as we're planning for the fall and we're planning for the summer, we're really putting those students who, who were impacted the most at the top of the list of students that are going to get that support. Now, the Biden administration is reportedly considering canceling student loan debt for all Americans. You recently announced plans to cancel a billion dollars of student loan debt for students defrauded by colleges and universities. Who would qualify for student loan cancellation and what are the pros and cons? There are a lot of conversations about student loan uh, debt forgiveness and, and assisting students who are really struggling in debt. You know, and that's part of the conversation and we're eager to continue those conversations, but it's also our responsibility to make sure we're stopping the bleeding and stopping these practices that I call predatory education practices, where we're selling a bill of goods and then we're seeing our students uh, graduate with eighty, ninety thousand dollars in debt and they're, they're getting degrees in jobs that either don't exist or jobs that are not as high paying to pay those debt. And then those are folks that can't buy a home or start a family because of that. Um, so we have to address that. We have to make sure we're providing loan forgiveness opportunities for students that are uh, serving in the public. Uh, we have to monitor our policies to make sure that we're getting a good return on investment. But loan forgiveness is a part of that conversation. And we're eager to continue those conversations, not only now, but making sure that as we move forward, we're addressing some of these uh, practices that got these students into debt in the first place, and we're doing that aggressively. According to Pew, at least 30 states have introduced legislation to ban transgender women from high schools, college, women's sports. What are your thoughts on that issue? And is the administration considering any federal action to either allow or prevent transgender women from competing in high school sports? Look, there's some black and white answers here no student should ever be discriminated against. Transgender students have the same rights to participate in extracurricular activities as any other student. And, and that to me is something that we have to make sure we protect. You know, we're gonna get in, we're engaging in a review of our Title IX policies to make sure that there's no discrimination or sexual harassment in the policies and make sure that uh, including extracurricular activities, all students have an opportunity to engage. We know that athletics in particular is an opportunity for students to learn about themselves, participate as a part of a team. All students should have that opportunity and we're gonna protect that. You were confirmed as the Secretary of Education a little over a month ago. What do you hope to accomplish in this role long-term? You know, as I said in the beginning, we have an opportunity of a lifetime here. There's no educator or educational leader who has been in, in the position we're in now. It's our opportunity to hit the reset button on those things that we knew that we know didn't work in education. We need to think beyond the pandemic and think, what would we like to see our schools uh, do for our students? How do we equalize the playing field? 
in, in our country. A strong educational system does that, and I'm committed to making sure that, you know, at the end of my tenure, we have policies and practices that are aiming toward a trajectory of success for all students. And I want those policies to have a positive impact long after I'm Secretary of Education. Secretary, we thank you so much for, for your time. We look forward to checking in with you repeatedly as, as we see how these issues progress. And, and, and good luck to you. Have a great day. We appreciate you joining us on this ASP chat. Hey, it was my pleasure. Take care. Thank you so much, sir. Take care. Bye-bye.